And hi, everybody. It's great to talk with you here. Um, so I'm a professor at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, and I have been director of this environmental studies program here for 13 years and kind of showing you my age. Before that, I taught at UC Santa Barbara in geography, but I was affiliated with environmental studies there for 12 years. So I have been teaching environmental studies as a professor for 25 years. And I think my inspiration for ecotypes has come from all those experiences. Um, if you look at the subtitle of the website, the subtitle is Exploring Environmental Ideas. And that comes from my experience that uh, many of the environmental discussions that I've been a part of and heard, they strike me as both super important on the one hand, super important, but then also kind of highly constrained or predictable on the other, not always super creative. And that's, that's a concern of mine. And so this notion of exploring environmental ideas uh, is my way of talking about how we can collectively expand the circle of what we talk about and thinking about the ideas that influence us, but a whole host of ideas that shape how we approach environmental issues. Um, it's really important to me, Krista, that we give our students the freedom to imagine possibilities that aren't overly constrained by the social norms we generally find in environmental circles. And I think creativity demands that. So my, my root motivation is really to draw a bigger circle around environmentalism and a bigger circle around the environmental ideas we discuss. Um, and then two points about how to explore environmental ideas. A lot of discussion in environmental studies is about specific things like climate change or food or, you know, specific topics like that. And sometimes I use a phrase facts to frameworks to try to not just lodge our heads in facts, there's this one and that one, but to try to think about how they assemble, what patterns we see. And that means we have to look at some deeper assumptions, um, underlying the ways we make sense of facts, the ways we take action on facts. And I'm doing that in ecotypes via those axes, of which there are 14 at present, organized into three themes. The other thing about exploring environmental ideas is we're doing that in two ways. We have this kind of humanistic approach of just thinking of the concepts themselves and what, what resonance they have with concepts, but we're also doing it in the scientific way of thinking of our survey responses and how those data make patterns. And I like to blend things and I like to blend um, thinking about ecotypes with both concepts and data. So that's kind of a background and a broad approach I'm taking here. Those axes are really interesting to me. And in addition to the survey itself, um, you're also been doing like an ongoing research um, on those axes. And there's so much um, rich data actually available on the Ecotypes website. So specifically, I wanted to ask you about three of the axes that came up um, when my own students took the survey. And that's the technology, Mm -hmm. the spirituality, and then mm -hmm. the future axis. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just share my screen here for a minute so that we yes. can uh, look at um, the, the, some of the patterns mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. I, I thought were interesting. So this technology axis, uh, we've been reading this short novella called Mana. Mm. Uh, it's really weird. And in MANA, there are two different uh, versions of the future imagined. And one of them, technology is basically enslaving people. Mm. And in the other, technology has liberated everybody to follow their, their dreams. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. what have you noticed about this pattern? And what does this chart kind of say to you about that technology access? Yeah, great, great question. Um, just a quick background. Technology, I think, is one of those things where environmentalists have long been ambivalent. That is, there are some things for which all environmentalists agree, like we must take action on climate change, right? I mean, there are no environmentalists that say we shouldn't. But environmentalists are really mixed over whether technology is a good or a bad thing. 
And that ambivalence is important for us to explore. So I don't think it's a bad thing that we're ambivalent. And you see that a little in the chart right here, where, and this is just the patterns from this year's responses by students throughout the US mostly. And you see that students are generally leaning toward what I call the philic uh, pole and not the phobic so much. Students are a little more hopeful about the possibilities of technology to solve problems than phobic. But you see the spread, it actually goes all the way across. Um, there's a survey word people use that you may have heard called social desirability bias. And that kind of means we say what we think people want us to say, right? And I think most people learn in environmental studies courses that, you know, technology isn't all bad and maybe we have to use some. And so it's possibly that the results are skewing a little bit because of social desirability. I wouldn't say that these results are typical of everybody everywhere, um, but they are suggesting that many of our students are open to technology. Now, when we want to go a little deeper and think about that, we have to, as like good scholars, we have to think about really interesting contradictions like, like, um, well, like in sustainability, and it's maybe not a bad contradiction, but you kind of have pieces of it that are all about permaculture, and that's kind of maybe low technology, and other pieces are about like solar panels, and that's a super high technology. Mm -hmm. And so even though many of us kind of have a general leaning, like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with technology, or no, I'm not, in practice, we tend to bundle things together that actually mix up that technophobic and technophilic pole. Um, I guess the last thing I'm thinking about is when you take that technology and bundle it into its theme, those ecotype themes, just look for associations between axes, you get a really interesting um, relationship between technology and other things like science, um, spirituality, which I think we're gonna talk about. Um, and and it's, the theme is called knowledge, looking at old versus new knowledge. And, and technology seems to be right in the middle of this, um, what I hope to call kind of a creative tension, a discussion we have about if we're gonna really live on earth in the way we want, well, how do we inform ourselves? And where, where do we lean in terms of how we inform ourselves? And, and there's kind of a healthy discussion between those that are thinking of ancient wisdom and old ways as being the most important versus those who think of you know, scientific innovation and creativity moving forward is the most important. And this phobic versus philic is kind of getting into that tension we have. And I think that's an important discussion for us to continue. Mm. Absolutely. Let's take a look at the, um, the spirituality axis. Mm. I think you've identified exactly what came up um, when my students were posting about this, mm. perhaps because um, we live in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, the indigenous perspectives on environment uh, are very much grounded in a spiritual worldview um, connected to nature. Mm -hmm. um, Native Hawaiians consider the aina, the land, to be an ancestor. We are related to the earth. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if um, that affected um, my own and our class responses uh, but when you look at the overall survey results, uh, the way I read this, they also seem to lean towards the sacred interaction with nature. So, yes. goodness, in, today, in this day and age, what do you make of this mm -hmm. um, information? Yes. Thank you, Krista, because I think placing you and your students in that that context really helps me. These results are from students all across the US and you see that in, at least in these general ways, they actually may agree with the perspective you just provided. So maybe two kind of background points to think about for context. One is that you can tell the story of, let's say recent, maybe 20th century, late 20th century American environmentalism in two very different ways. One is that it simply arises from the accumulation of scientific facts about pollution and our impacts, right? And that's kind of the science story. So that means environmentalism is motivated by a rational response to scientific facts. We hear that all the time. 
This is a very different story because you can also tell the story of this resurgence of environmentalism from the late 20th century into now as coming from more of a spiritual impulse, as something about some spiritual affinity with nature and something very deep among people. And the response that you're seeing here, which you're right, this is strongly leaning toward a sacred pole, a very affirming pole of spirituality, of nature spirituality versus a secular pole. This is actually very true um, among Americans and many other peoples in general. So there is a lot of survey data about this. This is something I've written about quite a bit. And others, a uh, scholar um, with whom I collaborated at UC Santa Barbara, uh, her name is Catherine Albanese. And she wrote a book called Nature, Religion in America. And um, you know, religion scholars don't just look at what happens in standard institutional circles. Some religion scholars write about uh, sports and participation as a, as, you know, uh, you know, kind of a fan of a certain team as being a certain kind of religious thing. Many scholars have written about um, patriotism as a form of religion. Well, here nature becomes kind of a locus for religion and spirituality as well. And I think we're seeing that here. Now, it gets kind of interesting. The discussion gets kind of mixed up when you bring it back to this relationship between religion or spirituality and science, because there's a lot of kind of outside of environmental circles, there's a lot of more dismissive discussion, right? Um, conflictual discussion. If you think about uh, controversies around evolution, controversies around sexuality, you start thinking about how science and religion have been these dual moral authorities. And people lean into them in differing ways, some just one or the other, some sometimes both. And so there you have the basis for, again, another interesting discussion about how we should ground our environmental concerns, how we should um, promote those concerns, maybe to others, and ultimately how we guide our actions. You know, in what ways do they lead toward particular actions, what we should do? Um, so I find this all fascinating, that really the student responses here are kind of validating a larger cultural trend we see that's very different than the day to day, here are the facts of climate change and here's what we should do. They kind of can contradict that more science uh, based discussion. Hmm. Interesting, I'd love to um, talk more about that. I'm gonna have to digest some of what you said there. There was a lot, a lot there for me to think about. Um, and I think both the technology and what you're saying about this um, spirituality aspect um, and, and what you said about religions, mm -hmm. like is sustainability almost like a religion in that sense that you mentioned? That's just something I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna think about. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great um, question. A core, a core question in our class is about at our attitude toward the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should we be uh, terrified? Should we be excited? Mm -hmm. uh, where does our orientation toward the future, wh where does it come from? Mm -hmm. You know, I tend to lean on that post-apocalyptic spectrum and I blame all these novels that I've read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing that your work has kind of inspired me to do is, is interrogate my own worldview. Mm -hmm. How did I become that way? Yes. And, and what am I missing in mm -hmm. terms of yes. ways to feel optimistic? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering, uh, similarly, what you think about this future axis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. And I think your own uh, reflection on kind of you know where you're at and why is a great model for all of us because how do we come up with these various ideas it comes through a set of experiences we have and many of us have experiences that reinforce other experiences you know we tend to kind of move in a certain direction and then we have friends like you said books other kinds of things tend to reinforce a certain 
um, kind of way of coming at the world. And it's very understandable. And it's good for you and all of us to be more reflective on where that comes. Because without being reflective, we think it's just so, you know, and anybody who doesn't believe that, well, they're just an idiot. And well, that's kind of not a good way to relate to people. It's not a good way to relate to yourself. Um, so this feature axis, um, actually there are two axes in ecotypes. One is time and this one's future because I think something about time is really, really important at a basic level for how we approach environmental issues. And definitely this is one where crisis or a very apocalyptic notion is on one pole and possibility or hopefulness is on the other. Um, it's been intriguing for me to talk with my own students over the years and hear that it's almost an article of faith. If you're an environmental studies student, an environmentalist, you are hopeless. And I think, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Why? They can't be hopeful. They can't be optimistic about the future and still have friends. And see, that's like a social norm. And I'm worried about that. I mean, there's a lot of reason to be worried about the future too, but I'm also worried about what it means for a person to kind of be just basically hopeless. So that's my own personal view on it. Now, what you see here is, again, among the responses, there's a leaning toward possibility. And uh, we also saw that technology leaning in that direction a little bit. There may be a little social desirability there. It may be students that take environmental studies are a little more co committed to action. And thus, you know, they're kind of a little more grounded in hope than hopelessness. It may be. But I do hear a lot of hopelessness among my students. Um, in a larger sense, I've been intrigued in environmentalism among students uh, with whom I work that there is a huge amount of resonance of both utopias and dystopias, these perfect dream worlds we're trying to achieve and these, these awful nightmare worlds that we, you know, that we want to get rid of or that may happen in the future if we don't do anything. And, um, and those utopias and dystopias are highly charged. You know, apocalypticism, apocalypticism is highly charged. Being giddily hopeful about, oh, technology is going to solve our problems, that's highly charged. And one thing I try to do with students is say, can we just kind of lower the volume a little on what we want, what's good or bad, and just kind of look at what is. Let's just kind of understand a little of what is, just accept things a little more get a little more curious about things and how does that help us understand things more deeply? And I don't know if you want me to go into this, Krista, but you know, with my students, I, I, I try to help them in a sense, decouple um, facts from fear. Um, to me, there are so many facts out there in the world. If you just lined up all the information we have about all the things going on, you know, anybody could select from them and come up with a really hopeful picture of the future. And someone else could select from them and come up with a very hopeless view of the future. And so we know it's kind of hard to take everything that we hear and put it together into a package and say, oh, well, we should be apocalyptic or we shouldn't. In fact, that's how frameworks work. Back to facts to frameworks. Frameworks not only organize information, they tend to get rid of information that doesn't fit the framework. The other thing I, I, I discuss with my students is if we look back at the, the sages, the, the wise people who have helped us over time and inspired us over time and have given us hope over time, they often do not base their hope on facts alone. Let's look at the IPCC report that came out last fall. It was very distressing. They were talking about, oh my gosh, look at what's going to happen in just a few years. Um, and it sounds impossible to be hopeful when you get all these facts coming at you. But I think if we look at wisdom traditions and, 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 and people who tend to inspire hope in us, they seem to reach deeper than just thinking about, you know, what's the, if we extrapolate these facts, where we're going. That's super important information, but it may not be a, a, a full basis for thinking about should I, should I be optimistic or not? Now, I know that's not a majority view that I have, but that notion of decoupling facts from fear is important to me so that my students can look at the facts as they are mm -hmm. and not filter them because it just makes them so darn hopeless. They don't want to hear any more of them, right? 
That, that's also something that I say often. I will say, I hear a lot of students say things like, oh, Waikiki will be underwater soon. Hmm. And not exactly, you know, it, it shifts the conversation if you can say, we anticipate 1.5 feet of sea level rise by the year 2050. And then you can visualize where that is and how old, where you might be in the year 2050. And then you can think about it differently. Mm. When yes. you separate fact from fear, as you said. And then we layer that with other facts about the the kind of changes in demographic diversity and the kinds of economic and political changes taking place in the world. And, and, and again, you can just immediately just move those toward a hopeful or hopeless pole, or you can just kind of take them as they are and you see, hopefully, all kinds of realities, but also all kinds of possibilities. Again, trying to expand the circle, look at interactions mm -hmm. and think about multiple scenarios for our right. futures. Right, expand the circle. I like how you put that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna be sure we have the um, information and link to your website where a lot of this um, material is, is contained. It's just a very rich um, website. And as we begin to um, wrap up here, I wondered um, kind of as you were just saying, are you seeing changes in the responses or um, as an individual can an individual's responses change and what influences that mm. yeah good questions so ecotypes is a project that i launched almost exactly two years ago so mm -hmm. i don't have a lot of time to see maybe everybody kind of shifting over time by the way i have noticed that among students um, I always joke that the, the, the containers they bring in to drink water out of have changed over time, you know. They used to all be mason jars, at least at Lewis and Clark, for instance. And mm -hmm. now they're, you know, like, what's allowable? I know that's kind of trivial. But, uh, but back to ecotypes, I think the trend I see and, and, the, and the great um, hope I have comes from working with undergraduates here at Lewis and Clark College over the span of four years. And to hear them come in to my intro class, and this is just what, they've, it's what they strongly feel, but they're willing to admit it's what they've inherited. So the ecotypes response they give in their first year, they are willing to admit is very much of what they have learned to be true. And the ecotypes response they give at the end of four years, if they're an environmental studies major, is much more the one that they have built and fashioned on their own. And that will be different. In some ways, some of their ideas will be deeper. They won't change. In other ways, their ideas will totally change over those four years. And I think those trends are important for each of us to see as our ideas kind of, you know, grow in time. That's a good thing. That's learning. Mm -hmm. How about your own ecotypes profile? I'm curious um, what has surprised you or changed mm. in your own yes. profile. Well, you know, Krista, I wish I took ecotypes 25 years ago when I started teaching this stuff. Uh, now I'm kind of in way deep. Um, but I do know just from, from the books I had as a grad student in Berkeley, um, uh, there's one axis that we didn't discuss, and it's kind of that spatial scale axis. And it's that thing about whether we should do solutions locally or globally. And mm -hmm. I think I was much more a localist back then. Uh, I remember this book I had about how to make a house that's like perfect and it's self-sufficient and everything like you don't need anybody else in the whole world because when the apocalypse strikes, you'll survive. And now I look back at that and I say, oh my God, that's turning us all into little islands. And I'm much more global in my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look at my actual ecotypes responses recently, and my students see this too, my, so there's another thing you can use uh, to look at your ecotypes response, and it's called your polarity score. And it's basically how much your responses go toward the extremes. Now, we tend to think that's a bad thing because we should be more balanced, but sometimes being more in the middle means you just kind of maybe don't have it figured out, you're a little more muddled. It can mean either thing but I've noticed in me, my responses are much more polar than many students. And students find 
over time, their responses become much more polar as they settle into a stronger belief. And that's an interesting point of discussion. Are people with polar responses just irredeemable and they'll never reason with you and they're just kind of out there on the edge? Or if they found a strong position to be in? I mean, I hope it's the latter because that's kind of where I am. Mm. Wow. I really want to thank you for um, everything that you've put into this work. I can see that there's just years of thought and lots of data analysis um, and really provocative questions that come out of this work. So I really appreciate it. And again, I really appreciate you for taking the time to talk with me and my students here in Hawaii today. Is there any um, last words you'd like to add? No, just thank you, Krista, for giving me the opportunity to have this conversation with you. It was fun. And students, thank you. I know you just have to sit and listen to this. It's not as fun as a conversation. Uh, there are opportunities to comment. You can always email me. You'll find that on the Ecotype site. I'm always interested in your thoughts and reflections because that really helps me understand how you understand these environmental ideas better. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. Aloha. Yes, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.